The Gannett Distinguished Lecture Series is designed for RIT graduating seniors in conjunction with their senior seminar taught by the faculty in the College of Liberal Arts. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them as well as express appreciation to Andrew Moore, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, and Provost Scott, excuse me, Provost Stan McKenzie for their strong support of this important and unique program. Our focus throughout this year is citizenship in the new millennium. Because many of you who are here tonight are here for the first time, I want to urge you to attend all of the lectures this term and next. Series brochures just are going to be outside the auditorium. Uh, please uh, feel free to pick those up on your way out tonight. And if you do, as you will see from the description on the brochure, our distinguished speakers have all been called upon to address certain questions about what it means to be a citizen in an era of technological innovation and socioeconomic globalization. Here are the key questions. Does our globalized society create new conditions for freedom? Does it, threaten new does it threaten new constraints on democratic development? Does it increase dangers of loss of privacy and uniformity, even as it encourages communication across the globe? How can we, as individuals and members of local, national, and world communities, make ourselves heard? And how might we foster social and economic justice within the United States and throughout the world. When looked at with these concerns in mind, it is clear that citizenship in the new millennium, as well as in the old one, demands both dissent and vision. Dissent and vision, in turn, require careful gathering of information, analysis of structures of money and power, and a willingness to press for the interests of democracy. Ralph Nader, our speaker tonight, represents these qualities of mind and courage more than most. Indeed, he has been honored by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential Americans of the 20th century. Ralph Nader is often called a consumer advocate, and this label is surely accurate, and has been since 1965, when he exposed unsafe and unfair practices of the auto industry with his book, Unsafe at Any Speed. But to do justice, and that is what Ralph Nader would have us do, it is more precise to say he is a citizen advocate. As he has put it, and I'm quoting from him, to go through life as a non-citizen would be to feel that there's nothing you can do, that nobody's listening, that you don't matter. But to be a citizen is to enjoy the deep satisfaction of seeing pain prevented, misery avoided, and injustice decline. As, end quote. As one of this country's most dedicated citizen advocates, Ralph Nader has made this country a safer place for all of us. He was instrumental in creating the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission. He helped draft and pass the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Meat and Poultry Inspection Rules, and the Freedom of Information Act. He has formed numerous groups, including PERGS, the student public interest research groups that operate in over 20 states. And he has, of course, led the growing movement in this country to reform campaign finance practices and other imbalances of, pra of power. Challenging the corporate control of the entrenched two-party system, he has run three times for president, working with the Green Party to rally reform and demand that issues of crucial importance for democracy really be aired. Ralph Nader is the author of many best-selling books, including Winning the Insurance Game, Why Women Pay More, and Getting the Best from Your Doctor. His most recent consumer education books are Children First, a Parent's Guide to Fighting Corporate Predators, and No Contest, Corporate Lawyers and the Perversion of Justice in America. And just out is the Ralph Nader Reader, which I'll hold up here, which you can buy copies of tonight or in the campus bookstore. Ralph Nader is, in short, a man who has devoted his life to living out his own definition of citizenship. It is an honor to have him here at RIT. Please join me in welcoming him.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Quimby. I'm astonished by this modern technological. I've never seen this before. Thank you very much for the signer as well. <clears throat> it's nice to be back here. Uh, I was here quite a few years ago on a typically bitter cold winter day. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and this evening, the topic uh, uh, of uh, my focus is going to be democracy, big business, and the political duopoly. And <clears throat> before I get into the subject, I'd just like to lay a framework uh, for some of you who are uh, 18, 19, 20, 21 uh, years old. And that is uh, to uh, plead that you raise your expectation levels about what you're going to be in life after you graduate, what kind of mark you want to make on this world, because we all grow up with certain horizons, some of them quite restricted, without our knowing about it, and we focus a lot about our own self-improvement and advancing our uh, state uh, of being a private citizen, having a good standard of living, uh, a good job, good retirement, good vacation benefits. Uh, and we tend to, uh, especially at your age, uh, tend to sell yourself a little too short about what you can be like. So let me give you a little framework uh, from a, a perspective that I wish I had when I was uh, uh, in school. You have about 15,000 days, or a little over 2,000 weeks, before you turn 65. <laughs> Did last week go quickly? <laughs> you can rest assured that time will, grow, will pass much more quickly with every decade as you advance into your 30s, 40s, 50s. You'll be astonished how fast the time goes. Uh, secondly, and this is quite important to keep in mind, is that most of us, if not all of us, grow up in our country corporate. We grow up looking at the world through corporate eyes. And it's very easy to test this, and I'll just uh, give you two quick things to think about, and then we'll come back to it. When I say the following words, crime, violence, welfare, regulation, what comes to mind? And if you were asked to list everything you owned and you started out with some of the big items and ended up counting how many paper clips you owned, would that be the end of what you owned? We'll get back to that in a moment. The important thing, however, is to ask ourselves why in a society which presumes to be a functioning democracy do we look at so many things around us exactly the way corporations would want us to look at? And I realized that at a young age when I started looking at cars. And I could always spot the make and model as a child. In fact, I uh, was rather proud of how quickly a car could come within visibility and I could tell my parents what kind of make and model it was. And later on, when I was at law school, I began to be interested uh, in uh, unsafely designed cars because I saw hitchhiking all over the country. Often uh, the crashes would occur and the truck drivers picking me up would be first at the scene, and the scenes were pretty grisly indeed. And when I went to law school, I learned that there were no safety standards for motor vehicles at the federal level and only perfunctory and incomplete ones at the state level. In other words, the auto companies built whatever kind of car they wanted to build, whatever kind of brakes, handling systems, tires, <coughs> crash protections. And some doctors began studying what happens in crashes, the dynamic of crashes, and how people uh, were killed in 15 mile an hour collisions because their head would hit the rear, rear, rear mirror uh, or they would be impaled by a rearward displacing steering column in a left front collision, or in a rollover, the doors would pop open and they would be thrown out on hard pavement, uh, or uh, they would be hurled through the windshield because there was no seatbelt in cars at the time. It intrigued me that the law, which usually uh, 
tends to humanize technology at its best, uh, didn't have a role here. And so I wrote a paper uh, on the subject, third year at law school at Harvard. And what I realized was that the power of the auto companies to decide who lives and who dies by the margins of technology that it uh, made possible or not possible to use uh, was not uh, a subject of public deliberation. People didn't discuss it. Cars were viewed as horsepower monsters. They were viewed as styling uh, changes. People uh, went into showrooms and they picked a car based on color, interior decor, acceleration capability, size, whatever. But the standards of purchase did not include uh, fuel efficiency or safety or ease of maintenance and repair or emission controls. Uh, this further piqued my curiosity. And I would write letters to, as a student, to uh, uh, the auto companies. And I would say, send me your safety studies. Send me your crash uh, results. And I would give back a letter saying, dear law student, thank you for your interest in our cars. Enclosed are some recent colorful brochures about our new models. <laughs> And the more I looked into it, the more I realized that this first leading cause of death for people between the age of 4 and 24, motor vehicle crashes at the time, this was in the uh, 50s, 60s, the first leading cause of death received almost no intellectual input on university campuses. Engineering schools uh, didn't do research in the area. There was no such thing as a PhD in automotive engineering in the United States. You have to go to Europe to get that. And only a very few uh, universities did any work at all. And what work they did do was funded by the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense realized in the 1950s that they were losing more Air Force personnel on the highways in America than in the Korean War. And they decided to do something about it. And they funded Cornell Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, and a couple engineering schools in order to determine how cars could be built that would be more crash protective. So if you had the collision, you could walk away with no or minimal injuries. And not surprisingly, the research showed that padded dash panels, collapsing steering columns, seat belts, uh, head restraints, stronger door latches, stronger door side door protection, stronger seat anchorage. All these were within the state of the art of the automotive industry uh, largely before World War I, but they weren't in the cars. And people would be in collisions that they couldn't survive, that any number of engineers working for the industry could tell their bosses how these cars could be built. So they could survive. Now just think of that in the construct of a lot of problems today. Number one, the public was not aware of what cars could be like compared to what they were like in terms of fuel efficiency, safety, crash protection, emission controls, maintenance, repair. Without that awareness, without that comparison, they couldn't demand anything different because all the auto companies produced roughly the same kinds of cars. And because they couldn't demand anything different, because they didn't see what the differences could be, the auto companies justified what they were doing by saying, we're giving people what they want. And what, how was what determined? They bought the car, didn't they? So obviously they were satisfied. Now the moment Congress began investigating this in the mid-60s with huge publicity. People began to realize that their friends and relatives and children who were killed in cars or other vehicles might have survived, might have walked away. And so the public understanding put the pressure on the auto companies to take off the shelf a lot of the simple safety devices the padded dash panel, by the way, was developed by the ancient Roman chariot manufacturers. <laughs> the seat belt was, uh, was used by Air Force pilots in World War I so that when they did their maneuvers in Europe, they didn't fall out of their plane. 
The collapsible steering column was patented in 1913 by automobile industry inventors. So it wasn't like they were being asked to create something, probe the un unknown. And so they started building cars under government pressure and public demand where people's lives were saved. So the death rate went from 5.6 fatalities for every 100 million vehicle miles traveled in 1966 to 1.6 fatalities in uh, 1999. Right now, there would be well over 100,000 more Americans killed every year and hundreds of thousands seriously injured were it not uh, for what happened in the mid-60s with the congressional hearings and the establishment of the motor vehicle safety laws, which created the auto safety agency and a research capacity by the federal government. Now, clearly, the technology was available, but it didn't have democracy behind it. The motor vehicle was not subjected to democratic evaluation. It was not subjected to democratic exposure. It was not subjected to a deliberative process where the society at large said, we are not going to let a few executives at the top of these companies keep their engineers at bay and handcuff them. And we have far more important priorities than the myopic goals of these auto insurance executives namely the saving of life and limb and the prevention of billions of dollars of expenses that occur when people are injured or killed. And that, that decision to design a car will have to be shared with the federal government in a deliberative process that allows the auto companies to have their say along with other groups, other safety groups. Now one can say that the society enveloped the auto companies in a deeper level of democracy, from which, by the way, they have emerged in the last few years and reasserted their more unilateral decision-making. But that's the cycle of regulation and the counterattack to it that marks our history. But as you noticed in the Firestone Wilderness ATX Tire Ford Explorer tragedies, which have now reached 146 deaths, in this country alone, uh, if, the, if the public input is not clear, if the government doesn't do its job and enforce the law, uh, the companies will revert back to their negligent and careless and cover-up ways. Now, when you elaborate this about growing up corporate, you can become quite humble in how we've shelved our natural curiosity our natural questioning process. For example, crime, violence, welfare, regulation. <clears throat> there is far more corporate crime with far more damage in this country than street crime, bad as street crime is, which has been declining, by the way, in the last few years. These crimes represent either deliberate or criminal negligent acts that produced the following preventable deaths and injuries. 56,000 worker-related deaths a year, workplace-related deaths a year. That's toxics, particulates, coal mines, foundries, steel mills, textile mills, etc. There are 80,000 deaths in hospitals alone, excluding emergency rooms, due to the grossest form of negligence and indifference according to the Harvard School of Public Health study that was conducted a few years ago. There is about 100,000 deaths a year from misprescription or overprescription of prescription drugs. There are tens of thousands of deaths that occur because of defective products that explode, burn, or toxify their victims. And even in the area of addictions, like tobacco, you have to have some responsibility, not just on the addic addicted person, but on the addictors, the corporations who developed a marketing scheme that told them that if they could hook a 12 or 13 or 14 year old into smoking, they got them for a lifetime, from which one out of three will die from a tobacco-related disease. 
65,000 Americans die every year from air pollution, preventable. And so the toll goes on and on, but by now you can see, and by the way, 400,000 people die from tobacco-related diseases every year. We uh, have this double standard where if you are a drug dealer peddling heroin, uh, you can go to jail for life. But if you're a tobacco company peddling to kids uh, tobacco, you get invited to the White House for diplomatic dinners. We have a, uh, nicotine is one of the most addictive substances that people are exposed to. Uh, you have a, a situation where the mayhem has been basically legitimized or subject to modest penalties and not given the plane of attention that street crime is given. The Delcon Shield uh, mutilated tens of thousands of women here and abroad years ago by the A.H. Robbins Company in Richmond, Virginia. The company learned about the damage, continued to sell it, the product. Now the insurance company learned about the destruction, kept its mouth shut, continued to receive premiums from A.H. Robbins for potential coverage in case of liability. Asbestos has claimed over 200,000 lives in this country since World War II. The connection between asbestos, asbestosis, and mesothelioma was known to the asbestos industry in the 20s and 30s. Internal documents have demonstrated that in subsequent litigation. The lead industry, which managed to poison the world with lead, and its connections with uh, its other companies, put lead in gasoline and lead in paint, none of which were crucial to the functioning of those products, but they were profitable to the lead industry. And lead-based poisoning is one of the most serious health devastations in the world, at least man-made. In this country, about 200,000 poor children are uh, poisoned by lead-based paint particles peeling off crumbling apartment walls. And that means brain damage and damage to vital organs. Sometimes low level that, that are explained away as learning disabilities because the screening process is still inadequate, although the federal government will pay for it. The states are not doing the full job in screening youngsters for blood le lead levels. Now I'm giving you a few of these illustrations to indicate that when someone uses the word crime, you think of street crime. We all did and do. You don't think of corporate crime. You think of crime in the streets and not crime in the corporate suites. And crime and violence often go hand in hand, but sometimes corporate crime is just economic. It's insurance companies and banks cheating you it's HMOs ripping you off. It's the kind of scandals that are reported in the New York Times, the kind of scandals that are reported on page one of the Wall Street Journal on 60 Minutes on 2020. There's nothing you hear tonight that it hasn't been reported in the mainstream press over the years, but very little, if anything, is done about it. The General Accounting Office, which is the investigative arm of Congress, reported a few years ago that 10% of the health care dollar is cheated away from people through health care computer billing fraud. That is those printouts that most people don't understand because they're in code that you get from your hospital or from your medical servants. Duplicative charges, charges for services never rendered, etc., amounts to over $100 billion a year with a B. If the insurance laws were enforced in this country, according to Money Magazine, hardly a radical publication, produced by Time Warner, we would save $60 billion a year. The Department of Transportation has estimated auto repair fraud runs around $40 billion a year. You know, pretty soon, 60 billion here, 40 billion there, 100 billion here, it adds up to real money, doesn't it? 
I mean, the burglars and the bank robbers could only drool at the prospect of what the object of, his, of their theft turn around and take from innocent people. There was a, a company uh, three to four years ago that announced, Advanta, credit card company, said, henceforth, any customer that quit the company would be charged $25. <laughs> now you would say, who in their right mind would write a check for $25 to a company after you decided you didn't want to do any business with them? It's not your choice. It's debited. We are losing control of our money, not just in traditional senses of being defrauded, or subjected to price fixing or deceptive advertising, we are losing control of our money per se with credit card, debit systems of payments, electronic transfer systems. And increasingly, if we complain, they tell us, you want to complain some more? You know what's going to happen to your credit rating? And then we don't complain because we don't want anything to happen to our credit rating. And pretty soon, the entire vendor economy is going to be like your bank. When your bank charges you $29 for a bounce check, which costs them a buck and a half, including covering fraudulent checks, losses, what can you do about it? You get your monthly statement, and it's debited. They've got your money. What you can do about it, of course, is to get out of the bank and get into a credit union but most people think that's pretty inconvenient. They like to be part of a big bank. A big bank that gets into trouble gets bailed out by your tax dollars in Washington, whereas a small bank or credit union is not likely to. Welfare. You think of poverty, poor people, getting welfare checks. The biggest welfare kings and queens are corporations. If you're a big enough corporation now, or a powerful enough industry, and due to speculation, corruption, or mismanagement, you start heading to go belly up, you go to Washington instead of going bankrupt. You will be paying for the SNL bailout of about a thousand SNLs in the 1980s and early 1990s, run by essentially speculators and crooks who took over those SNLs in order to use their cash, you'll be paying for that until the year 2020. It costs the American taxpayer $500 billion, half a trillion dollars, in principal and interest to bail out those SNLs floating the bonds that were 30-year bonds, in addition to outright appropriations. We would go up to Congress in 89 and 90, and we'd say to Congress, the drinking water systems in this country need repair. How about a couple billion dollars? No money. We'd say that infant nutrition, poor infants, they need some of that food. No money. We'd say, what about another $50 million for the motor vehicle safety research programs? No money. What about another $200 million for legal aid for poor people so we could have some semblance of equal justice under law. No money. But at the same time, they were passing $51 billion monies to bail out the SNL crooks. Whether it's a defense contractor, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry, whether it's the agribusiness giants, there is hardly an industry in this country that doesn't have its handout for subsidies, ha giveaways, bailouts, loan guarantees, technology transfers, free natural resource giveaways. The Canadian company Barrick Corporation came on federal land, discovered gold in Nevada and a few years ago. It was worth $9 billion under federal law that is now 128 years old. It goes to Washington with its geologist, documents the gold mine find, find, that's nine billion with a B, 
And it was, it was uh, able to demand that the U.S. government sell the land over the mine that gave it full title to all the gold for $5 an acre. It got $9 billion worth of gold, your gold, your gold, our gold, for $30,000, with no royalties back to the U.S. government from their profits or sales. Corporate welfare. Two days ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that the New York Stock Exchange, the bastion of corporate capitalism in New York City, wants a new building on new land because this old building is not sufficient. A few weeks ago, I went on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange to see what it was like. It's really quite a scene, bustling around, all kinds of bids and asks and so on, offers, stocks being traded. And I talked with two gentlemen who were about to retire. They've been there a total of over 90 years. And I said, is it true that the New York Stock Exchange is seriously considering moving to New Jersey if it doesn't get New York City and New York State to build it a new headquarters, compliments of the taxpayers of New York State? One guy was eating a sandwich. He almost dropped the sandwich as he replied, baloney. <laughs> the other guy laughed and laughed and said, total nonsense. This stock exchange where I've worked 49 years from high school, this stock exchange is never going to move to New Jersey. They have to have personal contact with all the investment banking firms and all the corporate law firms and all the infrastructure. I said, you mean the New York Stock Exchange would not become the Hoboken Stock Exchange? They said, not a chance. Well, I said, why did the mayor and the legislature fall for that threat and desperately say that we're going to give you $1 billion of New York taxpayer money for this new building and land? They said, well, you know politicians. It's not their money. Now, in New York City, you and I can point out to a lot of needs, a lot of transit needs, a lot of housing needs, a lot of pollution control needs that could soak up that billion dollars. Instead of going to the richest stock exchange in world history, that could easily have bought land and built its own building in good old fashioned free enterprise style. But these corporations don't believe in sink or swim capitalism. They believe in swim capitalism, but when they start sinking, they jump on your back for corporate welfare. The same drug companies that are charging elderly people outrageous prices for the same drugs that they charge Canadians and Mexicans half or a third of the price are the same drug companies that you are subsidizing with billions of dollars of government research and development leading to pharmaceuticals entirely developed through National Institute of Health and U.S. government efforts, which under our government policy are given free under monopoly marketing agreements to one drug company or another. A number of months ago, a woman wrote us having serious ovarian cancer. She was uh, in her 50s. She had lost her $19,000 a year job because she was sick. She'd lost her health insurance. She went to her doctor. The doctor says, I'm sorry to say this is a very serious case, and the only thing I can prescribe is Taxol. And Taxol was being sold by Bristol-Myers Squibb. It was developed, discovered, tested by $31 million of your money under the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, and given to Bristol-Myers free under a monopoly marketing agreement. So Bristol-Myers paid nothing to develop or discover that drug. And you know what it was charging that woman for six treatments? $14,000. That's what's going on in Washington, D.C. Giant defense contractors wallowing in their gross inefficiency and waste, they just go to the Pentagon for another round of billions of dollars. It's called the golden handshake in Washington, D.C. And there are fewer and fewer 
giant military defense contractors, so there's less and less competition to bid for Pentagon contracts. And their grip on the Pentagon has been tightening year after year. The same is true for one industry after another because, and this is why it makes very little difference in area after area, whether a Republican or Democrat in the White House, because the decision that are made within the Food and Drug Administration and the Department of Defense, and Transportation and Agriculture are made by the corporate government in Washington, represented by 22,000 corporate lobbyists swarming over the city and 9,000 political action committees pumping money into both parties' coffers, candidate by candidate, Democratic-Republican committee by Democratic-Republican committee. And so the devolution of our government into the hands of big business proceeds irrespective of whether the Democrats or Republicans are in the White House. For instance, the regulatory agencies under Clinton Gore are as bad and in many instances worse than under Reagan Bush before because the, the grip of the corporate government, the money in politics, putting their own executives in key government positions at the cabinet, sub-cabinet level, has been accelerating. So the Food and Drug Administration hasn't been as bad for 29 years. The Occupational Safety Agency we worked so hard to establish, which has saved tens of thousands of lives, has been brought to a standstill. Not one toxic chemical standard released to protect workers in the last eight years. The Car Safety Agency has been crashed by Clinton Gore. Instead of an enforcement agency that would have prevented Firestone Ford Explorer and many others, is now a consulting firm to Detroit instead of a regulatory law and order agency. The Department of Agriculture is better termed the Department of Agribusiness. It's not dominated by small farms and small farm groups. It's not even dominated by middle-sized farms. It's dominated by ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, IBP, the giant beef processor, Smithfield Corporation, Tyson Foods. Those are the companies. Monsanto, the biotechnology companies, Novartis, and others. Now, you might say that regulation clearly is government and not corporation. And once again, it's very important to ask yourself, what is regulation? Regulation, best defined, is the rule of law that applies order to a society. It says, for example, you can't go 100 miles an hour in your car. You're supposed to cross the street at pedestrian crosswalk. It says there are th certain things we cannot do to one another, to harm one another. There are certain things corporations cannot do. But when corporations control so much of our government, they can regulate us through our government, through our government, by our government doing something that they want done that we don't particularly appreciate, or by making sure the government doesn't regulate something like HMOs who arbitrarily deny people health care and tie doctors and nurses' hands in order to maximize their profits, the health care they thought they paid for. But it's the direct regulation uh, by corporations that we don't pay any attention to. Now, most of you have purchased an insurance policy, opened a bank account, signed the bank deposit card. You have probably have credit cards. How many students here have credit cards, by the way? Well, almost all students probably have credit cards now. All you've got to do is look at your mail every week. We just came across one uh, credit card company that uh, puts one billion letters every three months in the mail, urging people to you know, join, join the crowd, so to speak. Now, when you look at your insurance policy, your landlord lease, your bank deposit card, there's all that fine print. 
Have you ever tried to change that fine print? Next time you go down to buy a used car or buy an appliance on, on credit or a credit card application, why don't you try something interesting? Just before they give you the pen to sign on the dotted line, ask if there's a chair that you can sit in so you can read all the fine print. Let's say you're, you go down, you buy a car from a dealer, auto dealer. So you sit on, you read it, and there are things you don't like. You've got your magnifying glass on the print. And uh, you cross out a paragraph here, double the warranty, knock out the binding arbitration that strips you of your right to go to court if you have a dispute with your auto dealer or your insurance company. And then you initial all your changes, as your teacher in business law advised you to do. And then you go back to the clerk or the auto dealer rep, and you say, you know, I got this car, and I've got this contract that you've given me. I've made some changes here. I think the warranty should be uh, twice as long, etc. And I think we got a deal. Sign on the dotted line. <laughs> you know, when somebody did that, uh, we wrote a book once called An Action Manual for Car Lemon Owners, and we had a, a form consumer purchase agreement for a car that was very fair and big type, clear English, and we urge people when they go down to buy a car, new or used, to put this on the dealer desk and ask the dealer to sign and let us know what happened. And the first person wrote back, he said he went down, he picked out his car, he, uh, he plunked down a copy of the consumer purchasing agreement, and the dealer called the police. <laughs> see, see, now all that fine print tells you what your responsibility is, and it's almost all your responsibility. It tells you what you can do, what you can't do. It regulates you. All that fine print is corporate regulation. You look sometimes at the fine print of your shrink wrap license when you buy software. This, this is a state of the art. This is where you are expected to agree to an agreement before you even open the product up. And you'll see how one-sided it is. Now what about what you own? You go through everything you own, furniture, clothing, stereos, computers, cars, motorcycles, books, you name it, and you get down to paper clips. Is that the end of it? We grow up corporate not, never thinking that we with other Americans own the greatest wealth in America. The Commonwealth, one-third of America's public lands out west with all the resources. We own the public airways over which the radio and TV stations transmit their programs. We're the landlords. They're the tenants. They pay us no rent to the Federal Communications Commission. They get it free since 1927. They have freeloaded on our public property. And they can tell us who says what 24 hours a day and who doesn't. And we own $5 trillion of worker pension funds. You know, workers with the pension funds. That's the biggest capital pool in the world. And we don't control anything of what we own, of those pooled resources. The broadcast industry controls the airwaves. The timber, oil, gas, coal, molybdenum, zinc, gold, and other industries control the public land dis distribution over the Department of Interior and Department of Agriculture. And the banks and insurance companies and big employers like IBM General Electric control the investment of the five trillion dollars that the workers own. Isn't it interesting that I went through high school, college, and law school and we never discussed the issue of what we own and what we don't control of what we own. And I'm not at all certain that anything has changed since then in terms of higher education. There are most law schools don't even have a course called corporate crime, even though there's a corporate crime wave documented by the Wall Street Journal and Business Week, etc., in the country. When I went to law school, we had a course called landlord-tenant. You know what? 
We never got to the to the to the uh, tenant. It was all landlord rights and landlord remedies. We had a course called Creditors Remedies, uh, never Debtors Remedies. You see how it was skewed the curriculum. Now ask yourself: Is your curriculum skewed? Does your curriculum bend? to the imbalance of power in our society outside the university? Do you have the kinds of courses or course content that would strengthen you as a consumer, as a voter, as a taxpayer, or in terms of your workplace rights when you get out? Say you're working for large companies. Do you have courses that show you how you can be stronger in terms of the citizen tools that you would learn how to use here at the university? If I were to ask you, can you write a thousand word essay on your academic skills, athletic skills, or social skills? I'll bet you you could, such as they are. But what if I asked you, can you write a thousand word essay on your citizen skills? Your first question might be, what are they? Uh, informed voting? Isn't it interesting that here we are near the end of your formal education, or certainly in the latter stages of it, and you went through year after year, never had an opportunity to develop your citizen skills. Here's one of them. Every state and the federal government has a Freedom of Information Act. It takes about one hour in high school to teach students how to use the Freedom Information Act to get information from government files and how to actually write a letter asking for, say, a meat and poultry inspection report or something like that. 99.9% .9 of the high schools in this country don't teach that critical skill. Information is the currency of democracy. If you don't know what your rights are to get information, it's hard to get in government files which you have a right to get under the law, you don't get the first base if you want to change some government policy or expose some government abuse or get the government to be less under the influence of corporate lobbyists who want to make sure that the information they have to give the government about pollution, for example, is not available to you. So controlling what we own is a very important agenda in this country. If we could, through intermediate mechanisms, invest $5 trillion of worker pension monies in investment outlets as if people mattered rather than currency speculators or forced condominium conversion projects or commodity straddles or empire building mergers and acquisitions which suck up enormous amount of investment funds, maybe we'd have a different kind of country. And what kind of country can we have? You know, I think if I was in charge of matriculation first week at a university, I'd have all the students sit down and say, I want you to take five hours and write the kind of world and the kind of country you would like to see in your lifetime emerge. Because our expectation levels are so low in this country that politicians can laugh all the way at the bank and have us run to the polls and elect and re-elect them. That's how low our expectation levels are. Someone asked you, what is your expectation level from your local, state, and national government? You'd be surprised, unless you were energetically involved in improving them, how you would be puzzled over that question. You know, this is the government that defended us from our foreign enemies over 200 years. This is the government that built our roads and our canals. This is the government that gave us Social Security. This is the government that provided Medicare for elderly people. This is the government that separated out great lands for national forests and national parks so people could go and breathe and connect with nature. This is the government that has done so much of the medical research that has produced so many of our life-saving pharmaceuticals. This is the government 
that has supported people who happen to be on the wrong side of the tracks and down and out with some sort of minimal economic safety net. This is the government that established the civil rights laws that were enforced, uh, that have been enforced to, to a varying degrees, but have rolled back some of the bigotry and some of the denial of equal opportunity for millions of Americans. This is the government that, 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 that. And it only happens because citizens make it happen. And it only happens because there's a shift of power from the haves to the have-nots. You check out the major social justice movements in our history. And they all have one common element. Some power was shifted from the people who had too much to the people who had little or nothing. The anti-slavery movement shift of power from the cotton plantations away to the freedom of the slaves. So they moved into the never-never land for another hundred years before the civil rights laws were passed. When the farmers were being sucked dry by the high interest rates of the big banks and the high freight rates of the railroads to send their produce to market, they roared out of East Texas in 1887 and in the next 25 years, pushed for the greatest political reform movement in our history. And it had one theme to it. It shifted more power back to the farmers and back to ordinary people, as it all turned out, with their political reforms. When women pushed for the right to vote, it wasn't just men who they had to contend with, and it wasn't all men. It was the liquor industry and the new manufacturing companies who didn't want women to have the right to vote because women were mobilizing against child labor exploitation in other hard edges of the early Industrial Revolution. And they didn't want women to have the right to vote to shift power on these issues more back to the voters and away from the companies. When the workers in the early industries were brutalized, it's hard to realize how, how, how they really were brutalized. The dangerous working conditions, the deaths, the sickness, the injury, the starvation wages, no security, no, no retirement, no pension, no unemployment compensation, no workers' compensation. And they started forming trade unions at great risk to themselves and their livelihoods and their family. And they succeeded, shift the power from the employers to the workers. And in the 20th century, the same thing. Whether it's the environmental movement, the unfettered power to pollute your lungs and your bodies was reduced. And more power was given to the citizens in courts of law and to the citizens through government, environmental, air and water pollution regulations, etc. This kind of shift of power is something we should think about today. Because in the last 20 years, what Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and Ted Roosevelt and Justice o William O. Douglas and Louis Brandeis and many others warned about, the concentration of power and wealth in too few hands short circuits a society's promise, short circuits a society's performance, and puts corporate greed over human need. And in the last 20 years, after a few years of corporations being subjected to consumer protection like auto safety, environmental, and other standards, have galvanized themselves into a greater structure of power over all aspects of our life. And when Business Week polled the American people, asked the question, do you think there's too much corporate power over aspects of your life? 72% said yes. And why shouldn't they? They feel it every day. They're losing control over more and more what matters to them. In the job, workplace, they're losing control of the privacy of their own information through all these computer databases that know more about you and you know about yourself because you couldn't remember it all the way a computer can. They're losing control over their human genes. They're losing control over their schools, their children, who are being taken under by these corporate hucksters. 
day after day, week after week, over-medicating them, undernourishing them, separating from parents, parents, teaching the kids to nag their parents for all kinds of products, violent programming, pornographic programming, programming that shortens the child's attention span. They're losing control over their government. They're losing control over their future. And they know it. In spite of 20 years of economic growth, the top 10% of the, of the population in wealth has reaped most of the benefits. In a stunning declaration of wealth inequities, the Department of Labor reports that the majority of workers today are making less in real purchasing wages and salaries than they made 25 and 30 years ago. Now think of that for a moment. In 1968, the federal minimum wage in real purchasing power would have been by 1999, if it was adjusted for inflation, $2.30 more than what it is today. In, in that period of 32 years, our economy has doubled in per capita output, and our economy has increased in productivity over 65%. And yet, the minimum wage today, federal, is $5.15, $2.30 in purchase power, less than minimum wage was in 1968. That's how far we have slipped behind. 47 million workers, full-time workers, one out of every three, don't make a living wage. They're making minimum wage, or six, or seven, eight, nine dollars an hour. Before you subtract the costs of going to work, another used car, another health, another li uh, auto insurance, another repair bill, etc. All the ballyhoo about this booming economy is true for booming corporate profits, for booming stock pro market prices, for booming executive compensation that is so much greater now than over the entry level wage. It was 12 times the entry level wage in the biggest 300 companies. The CEO paid himself 12 times in 1940 the entry-level wage worker. It's now 500 times. For all these, the economy is booming. For the top 10 percent, it is booming. But for most of the American people, the only thing that's saving them is the proliferation of low-paid jobs per family and the ability to go into greater debt. $6.2 trillion in consumer debt outstanding in this country. Two members of a family in many jobs today can't even make ends meet, and they've got to go more and more into debt. Three members in a family in many... What if three members of the family work in Walmart? You know what that is? That's maybe a total of $19 an hour for three people. That's three people earning $19 total an hour, a little over six bucks an hour. That's before deductions and before the costs of going to work. Forty-six million people don't have health insurance. Is it getting better? No, it's getting worse. Ten million more people don't have health insurance than when Clinton Gore came into office January 1993. Affordable housing needs are at a record high. Millions of households can't afford housing. People cannot afford 60 to 70 percent of their pay going to rent. Homelessness is up and hunger is up just from three years ago. Twelve million people are officially, children are officially classified as being hungry due to poverty. The charities providing free food, like Second Harvest, report they can't keep up with the demand. This is in the richest country in the world, the most powerful economy in the world, 2000 A.D., and this is what we have. Just look around, here in Rochester. When two big companies start laying off workers, the whole city quivers. 
heavy concentration of economic hopes on these two companies, Xerox and Kodak. The poverty in this city is quite, quite intense, but there are a lot of cities with this kind of poverty. 75% of the children in the Rochester City School District, I'm informed, are eligible for free or reduced lunch. One out of every four children in New York lives in poverty. You know the, you know the, uh, the lineup. How about this one? Child asthma rates are at a record high. Just the ability to breathe. And guess what? Guess where most of the incinerators are situated? in our country. It just so happens they're not in Scarsdale. They're not in Beverly Hills. They're where poor people live. In Hartford, Connecticut, inner city, asthma rates, 40%. Five incinerators are within reach of their lungs. How often do we say, leave no child behind? That was George W. Bush. That's about all he's done in Texas, is leave children behind, by the way. <laughs> Child poverty. <laughs> Second highest child hunger rates. The situation around the Rio Grande area is absolutely abysmal. Infectious diseases, pollution, congestion, contaminated drinking water. Now, what are we going to do about this? Well, most of you, you know, are, are going to join the contented classes after you graduate, if you don't already come from them. You're going to easily be up in the upper 5 or 10 percent or 1 percent of the income level. So there are a lot of opportunities in this country to escape. You don't like this public school in this inner city, and, you know, you just, you don't have to go there. You, your kids will go to private school or some suburb. You don't like the uh, housing, you, you can live where it's nice housing. So you can exit these problems instead of be part of the solution, if you will. But that's a terrible way to go through life. Because by the time you retire, you look back and you say, what did I do? Just piled up a lot of wealth and uh, argued with my financial planner? Uh, what did I miss? I, we, we interview a lot of retired corporate lawyers who are extremely successful, and they uh, very often admit to an empty feeling in their stomach because although they made a lot of money and they were heads of their bar associations locally and they got the proverbial gold watch on retirement from their senior partner friends, they missed the justice train. They missed the pursuit of justice, which is our collective responsibility. We inherited the results of the struggles of our forebears to advance justice, which Daniel Webster called the great work of human beings on earth back in the 19th century when he was a senator. They missed the justice train. They had great influence, these lawyers, great power. They got their calls returned. They knew how to solve problems for a lot of ordinary people. Instead, they solved problems for a lot of rich people and a lot of rich corporations and neglected their broader lawyerly duties. It's not something you're likely to project. It's something you should recognize, though, because there are very few people in this world that don't have a sense of justice. Very few. There's a sense of fairness built into all of us but we don't have a chance to express it and pursue it as often as we might. And that's why we have to redefine our time so we spend more of our time every week and month and year on our citizen duties and our citizen responsibilities. And there are so many problems in the country, you can just pick the one that you want to work on. No one has to pick it for you. You want to work on City Hall, you want to work on poverty, you want to work on tax shelters for corporations and deal, deal with that. You want to work on political reform, electoral reform. You want to 
uh, work on consumer protection, uh, uh, rights of minorities, whatever. It's all there. And as students, you're part of a generation that is attracted to community service, but that's charity, and that's important. That sensitizes you to other people's pain and injustice. But after a while, you get burned out if you don't see the objects of your charity being part of an overall prevention movement. You're not going to the causes of these problems. You may be working soup kitchens for hungry people. Why do we have hunger in this country? You may be filling in for uh, mentoring, and uh, why aren't the schools doing that? Because we don't have time for the important things in life. You know that? We got time for all kinds of derivative things. But more and more, the way our economy is designed, more and more members of the family have to commute further and further in order to work at jobs that don't pay them enough to have a decent standard of living. And the result of that is the loneliness of childhood, the abandonment of children, the inattentiveness to our schools by the parents who are so frantically busy and exhausted or feel powerless if they have the time. And that's why we need a, a new political and civ civic movement. Here in Rochester, there are all kinds of groups trying to make the city better. One of them set up a progressive credit union that's the best antidote to the loan sharking that goes on in the inner city. The payday loans, the rent-to-own rackets, the horrendous interest rate gouging, the shoddy merchandise. But the credit unions are basically community-owned, and they give loans for family needs and cars and homes at reasonable interest rates because the people who borrow from the credit union are the people who own the credit union. They put their money in it. It's a cooperative. This is why we have seen such tragedy in this country that the citizen groups are being shut out. They've been literally shut out from their own government by the influence of corporations and the corruption of money in politics. And what we need to do, very briefly, is to say to ourselves, is to say to ourselves, how are we going to use some of our time to build a new political reform movement? How are we going to use some of our time to enlarge and strengthen the quality of our citizen groups that we, that we like? And how are we going to be public citizens so that our private citizen lives and what we hand to future generations is in decent shape? We live in a world that is very tormented. Today, an average of 40,000 small infants, children, little children, died from totally preventable diseases like measles or contaminated water that gave them dysentery or fatal diarrhea. Today. Four billion dollars in the world was spent on military weapons. Forty thousand little children die. Four billion dollars. Those children can be saved throughout every day of the year by an expenditure of less than twenty-five billion dollars, according to the United Nations Development Program. Clean water, immunization, and minimal health care all over the world. We're spending $4 billion a day as a, as a world on military weapons. <clears throat> the outline of the future, I think, is, is something for us to ponder. And that is that we ought to think of a society that does not lead to the devastation of the global environment, that means changes like fossil fuels and nuclear power to solar energy. That means more organic farming, which is, by the way, one of the 
only way far small farmers can make a profit these days, we're told. That, that means, that means a whole convergence of technologies that may be serviceable for the companies themselves, like the infernal, eternal, internal combustion engine, into propulsion systems that are far more efficient. That means rationalizing our industrial processes for greater efficiency. There's a book out called Natural Democracy by a businessman. His name is Paul Hawken and Amory and Hunter Lovins were the co-authors. Uh, these are real uh, smart people with a lot of experience. And they claim that we now have the technology to get 10 times more work out of a unit of natural resource, like an energy unit, or metals, other products that we dig up from the earth. Industry is extraordinarily inefficient when you use the inefficiency yardstick globally. That's what we have to keep in mind. And that's why they called it natural capitalism. It's an excoriating critique on inefficient production systems as if people mattered. The auto industry, for example, may say, well, their engine is efficient for their purposes, but not for ours at 24 and a half miles per gallon. Give me a break. It's going backwards in the last 10 years. It's as low as it was since 1980. It may be efficient for the Ford or General Motors to sell those kinds of engines, but it's not efficient for our lungs. It's not efficient for our pocketbooks. It's not efficient for many other ways as well. And so we have to redefine productivity and efficiency as if people matter, not as if the next quarterly report of a corporation that refuses to internalize its costs in order to reduce and prevent them of corporations that externalize their costs on our backs like pollution is externalized. We need also to recognize that our curriculum deserves a heavy dose of civic skill training starting in grammar school, high school, and college. Whole generations of Americans are coming out without the slightest idea of how to be effective citizens or having the skills to become effective citizens. They don't have the slightest idea of the kind of country they can have because their expectation levels have been controlled by growing up corporate. In 1950s and 60s, Western European governments coming out of the rubble of World War II abolished poverty, essentially abolished poverty. They gave their people universal health care, which we don't have today, full paid maternity leave as a right of, of for all people, not just people who have unions. We don't have that today. Paid sick leave for themselves and their immediate family members. We don't have that today in the United States. Adequate and useful public transit so you can get to work without having to own a car. Lots of places we don't have that today and rights to form trade unions to enhance your working conditions and standards of justice that are far more facilitative in those countries like the Netherlands, France, Germany, Scandinavia than in our country. And when we look at what those countries did, and they're no particular bargains, they have their problems too, we can see how low our expectation level is when we accept things as they are today. I hope that those of you who are interested in pursuing the public citizen path will stay in touch with us so we can stay in touch with you. Our nonprofit websites for those students who want to see internship opportunities and postgraduate opportunities and all kinds of citizen groups and the various issues that established citizen groups have been engaging in that might commend themselves to your interest. The two websites are essential.org and citizen.org. Essential.org, citizen.org. Now, John Adams, our second president, put it presciently 
He's not known for his quotable remarks, by the way, unlike his friend Thomas Jefferson. But one day he, he was possessed of saying the following. This is 200 years ago. He said, our generation had to be composed of politicians and statesmen so that our children could become scientists and physicians so that their children could become artists and musicians. You see the trajectory? Look how far we are from that. See how far we are from that? In an economy that has increased its output 30-fold since 1900, more and more people could be living off capital investment, not just the rich. Instead of trying to pay last month's bills with this week's paycheck, going paycheck to paycheck with no assets. We have to raise our expectation level because a hundred years from now we can have an economy and a technology horrendously greater than there are today and we'll still have the results of age-old demonstrations of greed and corruption and all other human frailties that destroy life's possibilities for so many millions of people here and around the world. When you read some of the Greek, ancient Greek plays, and you read Shakespeare's plays, isn't it interesting that the same frailties that those plays etched in such memorable terms, the same human deficiencies, the same greed, the same brutalities, the same indifferences are prevalent today. And they'll be prevalent a hundred years from now. If we don't get sufficient motivation from the heroic activities of our forebears, from our own sense of refined empathy about what our country and world can be like compared to what they are, and from a sense of obligation to our descendants so that we can look to the future, hand this world to the future, and not have our descendants look back on us and say, with a broken planet, there was a generation that had to give up so little in order to achieve so much. The risks are growing for the planet from drug-resistant infectious diseases that are sweeping across continents, some heading to this country, to global warming and ozone depletion, to excessive militarization, to the brutalization of authoritarian regimes that may have some symbols of parliamentarianism, but we all know who runs those countries. From the increasing recklessness of genetic engineering that is not being governed by scientific discipline, Biotechnology must have the basic science as its governing discipline, and the commercialization of biotechnology is deploying it faster than the scientific questions are being asked and answered. All these and others are leading our world into higher risk patterns. We are either up to it, we're either going to redefine civic courage as a primary entry in our pantheon of courageous acts or we're going to go through life on our knees as long as we can make it economically. That's something we have to think about. We, we described our Green Party campaign as the politics of joy and justice. And someone asked me once, well, we've seen the justice. Where is the joy? And I said, they're one and the same. The pursuit of justice is a prerequisite for the pursuit of happiness. You look around the world, and there's a rather rigorous correlation between the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of justice and the reverse. And those of you who are engaged in the pursuit of justice will understand from your own experience that very often the pursuit of justice itself is an act of happiness. It is so gratifying.
in and of itself, quite apart from what it leads to in terms of the good life and the better society. So I hope you'll stay in touch with us and we can discuss any of these questions or issues or anything else on your mind in the discussion period. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it a lot, sir. Couldn't have uh, questions now? Is there a PA system here? There are two microphones. On two? The There's one over there and one over here. One there? People would just come down. Okay. You can call them. Those of you, if you don't want to come down, you want to shout out the question. I think the acoustics probably are pretty good. What do you think good. of the political crisis and the effect we had on uh, Florida? The political crisis, you mean in Florida? <laughs> I didn't quite hear. Oh, oh yes. What? Oh, that I may have cost Gore the election. <laughs> the, let's see. I think everybody, I think everybody has a right to pursue political reform in this country in one form or the other, and no one's entitled to any votes. I don't accuse Gore of costing me the election. And the, And if you want to go into what ifs, what if he didn't lose his home state of Tennessee? <laughs> and what if Pat Buchanan didn't cost Bush, uh, by your definition implied, the states of Wisconsin, Iowa, Oregon, and New Mexico? And what if Bush didn't take two days off in the last two weeks and campaigned in Florida? And what if Florida had a uh, 1970 form of election machinery? <laughs> And there, you know, there are a lot of what ifs, and we just, perhaps it will console you, although you probably won't agree, that uh, whether Bush or Gore in the White House, given the complexion of Congress, they're not making many decisions. It's the corporate lobbyists and their minions in Congress that are going to make the decisions, unfortunately. What do you think is going to happen next? Well, again, is it, you're talking just about the Florida situation? No, it's going to be the President of the United States. Oh, well, you know, your guess is as good as mine. The odds seem to be heavy against uh, Gore, but if the Florida Supreme Court rules for him, it goes back to the trial court, they run out of time, and the legislature is going to vote the electors uh, for Bush, and there will be a huge uproar, and Bush will be on the defensive for four years. Uh, further advancing his three assets of not knowing very much, uh, being lazy, and wanting to avoid heavy controversy. Oh, thanks for coming to RIT. I have a question for you. I was seeing great parallels between um, the example of the automotive industry and the uh, biotech industry today um, and I was wondering if you could tell us as citizen or have any suggestions for us what we can do considering that the biotech industry is putting billions of dollars in promoting this stuff and also that we only have four yeah. or five corporations that control our f food the processes in um, grocery stores. Well, first of all, this is a very ambitious industry. By its own definition, it, uh, it uh, seeks to alter the genetic inheritance of the planet and convert more and more of it into 20-year monopoly patents by Monsanto and others. So it's pretty ambitious, and it's not regulated. It's really not regulated. The, there's a perfunctory approval of genetically engineered crops by the Department of Agriculture, and they've never turned one down. 
Uh, it's not regulated. We don't have a legal, ethical, or regulatory framework for the most potentially transformative, if not jolting, technology the world's ever seen, short of nuclear bombs. And so the first thing to do is to bring it under regulation and to start a great deal of public discussion so that we have some sort of ethical framework here uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, evaluate it and to put boundaries on it or to liberate it or whatever. Uh, second, those of you who are interested in some of these questions, there's a Council for Responsible Genetics in Cambridge, Mass. It's a citizen group uh, started by MIT and Harvard scientists. Uh, and they put out a publication called Gene Watch and other reports. Uh, and they're basically a critical uh, appraiser of the biotech industry. Uh, and this is where their concern comes, is that the technology is being rushed into the marketplace and into the environment uh, before lots of scientific questions are answered. I mean, like the migration issue on genetically engineered uh, crops, its uh, relationships. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, thirdly, I think be, be very wary of new technologies that promise all kinds of things that it could occur by old uh, systems of justice. See? So if they say, well, we've got to feed people, um, there are lots of ways. There's, there's more food in the world today than is needed for everybody to have a nutritional diet. The problem is um, the distribution problem. The second is the spoilage problem. You know, 20, 30 percent of the crop is lost to rodents and uh, pests after the harvest, never mind, you know, before the harvest. So there are a lot of old-fashioned things that can be done uh, to achieve the same goals that are purportedly achievable by a technology that is messing around with some her tremendously complex variables and presuming that they're controlling these variables. Genetic complexity is very complex, especially uh, once it hits the marketplace, once it gets very decentralized and is, uh, is out of control of, say, the most rigorous scientists who developed the, the uh, product in the first place. Yes? Um, in the past year, with uh, events such as the anti-WTO protest in Seattle, the A16 protest in Washington, and with your campaign, we've seen the birth of a, a social and political movement in the United States. Where do you think this movement is going, and what do you think that we can do on the grassroots level uh, to bring it to where it should go? First of all, I think it's a movement trying to understand the new power configurations in the world. I mean, the Soviet Union-USA standoff is no more. Uh, and and, and uh, who's going to write the rules now uh, as all economies are moving away from a uh, the, the Soviet type economies are moving into a kind of, they're moving out of criminal capitalism into uh, criminal communism into criminal capi capitalism, it seems. And uh, this is where the global corporations are so dominant. They're, they command the technology, the labor, the capital, and the governments. There's not much more to command. Um, governments are on their knees if they get into trouble economically. Uh, the IMF, the World Bank, which are instruments of global corporate. Uh, uh, agendas, uh, loan them money and control them that way. So we have to understand uh, the, the different configurations of power and that's what Seattle is did and it, the, most of the disruption was over policing by the way. Police were not well trained in how to handle uh, mass demonstrations. They haven't seen any for so long in the cities. Uh, so some of them overreacted, and that led to a lot more media coverage. But the idea was to highlight the international trade agreements that are really forms of autocratic governance. And when you hear about World Trade Organization or NAFTA, these aren't just mechanisms to reduce tariffs. They are systems of governance that are federal law, that are law for 139 nations who belong to the World Trade Organization. And these systems of governance uh, mandate that trade is supreme to all other considerations. And that if you are in a country that another country thinks has too tough 
auto safety standards or food labeling standards, they take you to the WTO courts in Switzerland and you lose. Uh, you are considered a country that has non-tariff trade barriers. That is, uh, you're a country that has auto safety standards that are more stringent than other countries who want to ship cars to our country. And so they say, oh, it's unfair. Your safety standards are really trade barriers, and we're going to haul you to Geneva, Switzerland, and you're going to lose. And the courts are secret. You can't get in them as citizens the way you can in our courts. They're closed to the press. There's no public transcript. There's no independent appeal. They're total kangaroo courts. And yet we have to obey their rules. We either repeal our environmental regulation or safety regulation that's challenged by a foreign country under the influence of some industry that wants to ship to our country, or we have to pay economic fines to the country until we obey the decree of the court. All this went through Congress without a public debate five years ago. Uh, Mr. Clinton pushed it. Mr. Gore pushed it. Republicans in Congress pushed it. And it was the greatest loss of local, state, and national sovereignty in our history. Now, every treaty we sign, we lose some sovereignty. But not that comprehensive and not a, a basic silent coup d'etat, which is what it is. We've now lost five out of five challenges to our environmental rules by other countries. Venezuela took us on reformulated gasoline. Mexico took us on tuna dolphin, the Mammal Protection Act. And we, we, we lose them because the mandate of the World Trade Organization is to subordinate environmental, consumer, and worker health and safety standards to the imperatives of trade, which is exactly the reverse of how we've progressed in our country. Whenever we've progressed in worker safety, environment, consumer protection, abolition of child labor, our laws said to the corporations, you're going to have to swallow this advance, even if it affects your profits, you're going to have to adjust to it. You're not going to hire eight-year-olds anymore or ten-year-olds in dungeon factories. You're going to hire adults. You're going to have to pay them more, and your short-term profits may be affected. Too bad these children should be going to school. See, that's the theory. And our country now has signed on... The same for pollution controls on factories and so forth. And guess what? The companies adjust. Pretty soon they're advertising the law's benefits. Look at the auto ads now. They're bragging about airbags and new kinds of braking systems, all the things they fought us tooth and nail 30, 40 years against. They're bragging about it. So when you put the wood to these companies and say, look, here and no further. You are not going to erode the health and safety, etc., of the American people. They will adjust. But if they think they can overcome by paying off politicians and all the rest of it, then they won't. That's the contention. Now, we have signed down to a system of governance called the World Trade Organization, which, in effect, turns on its head the tradition of our country that we progress by subordinating commercial interests to the interests of human rights, workers, consumers, etc. Now it's the reverse. Now it's trade uber alles. And you see, with, with, with virtually no debate, what the Seattle Coalition has done is try to raise all these issues, and in church basements and union local halls and university auditoriums all over the country, more and more people are beginning to understand what those 500 pages or 800 pages of the World Trade Organization trade agreement portends as more and more of these challenges to countries that treat their people better uh, float to the courts in Geneva. These, this trade agreement does not penalize countries that mistreat their people. For example, it doesn't prohibit international trade in products made by brutalized child labor. You can't buy in Rochester a product from child labor in this country because it's illegal. But our country cannot prohibit imports of products from brutalized child labor abroad because to do so would violate the World Trade Organization, which says it's okay. The only prohibition in international trade of World Trade Organization is prison labor products. But a lot of these children are essentially slaves in these countries. 
Yes. Many citizens are wary and tired of commercial corruption and big business. On the same hand, many people view the government as a big business, as, as the same types of corruption. How as citizens do we ensure justice from not only the commercial sector, but the political sector as well? One is public funding of public elections. That's the first and most important reform. And we're, uh, we're going to be getting a portion of that, we hope, uh, through the McCain-Feingold bill, at least with the banning of soft money. Uh, that doesn't lead to public funding, but it gets rid of one big abuse. You know, the two parties raised $500 million in soft money. Soft money is money that corporations contribute to political parties, which then, in hardly disguised form, promote their uh, candidates, presidential and other candidates. Uh, under federal law since 1911, corporations cannot give hard money. They can't, for example, a corporation could not have made a contribution to Lazio or Hillary Clinton. But uh, corporations can make soft money co contributions to the Democrat Republican parties in New York State who then can use it in a variety of ways to advance their, those two candidates' prospects. And McCain-Feingold would ban uh, soft money. But we're still a long ways away from the simple principle that public elections should be funded by public money, either by tax money, which would be the best investment we ever made. There are companies that, that will put two, three million dollars in key congressional coffers um, and get a five billion dollar tax break. Or they'll get non-enforcement of laws uh, or that, that, are, uh, that would otherwise protect you from being ripped off. Uh, or they would get a three billion dollar subsidy. So it's the best investment we can make and it would cost to fund the federal elections, which would also involve a certain amount of free time for ballot qualified federal candidates for Congress and President on radio and TV. You know, we own the airways. We can say we want some free time back. We're the landlords uh, for these candidates in the few months before the election. It would cost the American people to fund the entire congressional and presidential election less than the cost of one B-2 bomber, which the Pentagon doesn't want any more of because it's lost the strategic value with the end of the Soviet Union and has trouble flying in the rain. <laughs> see, what, see what I mean? I mean, for relatively small amounts of money, we can vastly improve our political and election processes. So that's one. The second is, that we form more powerful consumer groups that not only in banking, insurance, HMOs, etc., but also in trying to do something about the commercialization of childhood. Our children are being hijacked by these hucksters. You know, if you're parents of young children, you know what I mean. Uh, the, the advertisement is beamed directly to children, which used to be unheard of a few decades ago. You never, you never saw this kind of direct marketing to children, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. And then they separate them from their parents. They show them how to put the guilt trip and nag their parents. And they basically create what McDonald's calls a child's world. A child's world. And uh, the corporate parent, this is their, their the marketing seminars phrases, the corporate parent prepares a week of corporate entertainment for the children. And now, of course, you have everything. You have the internet, you have video, you have television, you have uh, the description of every child aberration as a disease now for over-medication. You have uh, a huge campaign to pump sugar and fat in these kids' bodies, junk food. And children today are more out of shape and more overweight than at any time since records started being kept in 1900. That's what we're doing. They're doing. I mean, really, there's something sick about our country and our world allowing corporations to sell products that give people cancer, to sell products that give people heart disease and damage their health, to sell products to children to poison their minds, 
to sell politics to us in a deceptive and camouflaged way because they own the politicians, and on and on and on. Uh, to, to sell products that infect our bodies with contaminants and toxics in the workplace. I mean, let's, let's lay the issues right on the table here and see what's happening. Do you know, for example, since 1890, more coal miners have died in the coal mines from coal miner pneumoconiosis, preventable, and from coal mine shaft collapses, preventable, by the coal mine owners who are often steel companies or outfits far removed from coal country in New York and Chicago. More coal miners have lost their lives between 1890 and the present day than all the Americans killed in World War II. Over 400,000 coal miners have lost their lives. That's just one industry. One industry. You see, this is the America you don't see much on your TV. Jerry Springer is not going to talk about these things nor is Sally Jesse Raphael. They're using our property for the most disgusting sadomasochistic programs. Our property, and we don't have anything to say about it. At least Phil Donahue had some real serious programs. You know, I would go on Mike Douglas and Merv Griffin, who are a memory to most people here, and, and I, would, I would be in the green room with the Jacksons, or or John Lennon, and they would go on for their 15 minutes, and I would go on for my 15, talking about auto safety and consumer protection. You couldn't get within a mile of, you know, Ricky Lake and so on, unless you were some flagellating exhibitionist. <laughs> See? This is, uh, this is why... This is, this is why we are in a culture of decay. And it's a corporate culture. We're not generating our own culture anymore. Our own music and art, etc. Most of it now is, is corporate shaped and corporate choreographed. Yes. Who's next? You, yes. For the most part, you've already answered my question. Um, I'm from Syracuse. And the high school that I went to and some of the other high schools, Coca-Cola has been making donations for exclusive selling rights in the schools advertising and all that. Even here at RIT, we have try and find a Coke. But... Um, Why, does a Pepsi contract? Pepsi owns... What? Pepsi is... The, they own all of the selling rights for RIT. And you didn't do anything about it as students? What? How many people here prefer Coke over Pepsi? You can start a rebellion here. <laughs> now, uh, the first thing you've got to do here uh, you've got to ask your university leaders a very simple question. Please submit in writing your policy about the limits of commercialism on campus. Right from the beginning, very intellectual inquiry, because you know what? They don't have a policy. Anything goes. Anything goes on universities today. They do not have a policy, and you'll put them properly on the defensive by saying you should generate a policy, have hearings, we'll all testify, faculty, students, alumni, administrators, boards of trustees, and you will have a policy of what the limits between academic standards and commercial standards. Academic freedoms and commercial freedoms. Academic science or corporate science. Have a, have a, what are the standards here? Because there is something very precious about a university and college it's one of the three institutions generating knowledge in a systematic way in our country, government and business being the other two. And it's got to be arm's length. If it surrenders its freedom and surrenders its purpose and surrenders its standards, it is selling you as a product, you, the students, as a product to corporate vendors. And it is rupturing the free exchange of scientific information by accepting confidentiality agreements between professors and corporations. Professors who can't talk to the professors across the aisle or down the corridor because they've, they've got a gag order on them. And it will also lower your own horizons. And it will denigrate the humanities and the social sciences in favor of what are called the bread and butter courses. 
And when you denigrate in a university the humanities and social science, you might as well drop the word university. Just call yourself a trade school or a business school. So I would, uh, I would suggest the university has a website, correct? Right? Okay. Ask the university to place on the website all contracts it has above $100,000 a year, all contracts with corporations, consulting firms, and government agencies. And some of the government agencies obviously are national security, so they'll, they'll redact some of them, you see? Or they'll have the Pentagon redact. After all, you're a center of remodeling weapons, aren't you here? Are you going to be? We are? That's another thing. Is, is weapons development or upgrading or man, remanufacturing a proper subject for a university to be engaged in? I've always maintained it isn't. Uh, if if, if the, the Pentagon wants, they should set up their own institutes. They should, just like the RAND Institute does a lot of uh, reports and studies for the Pentagon and others, um, the university sh should not be in the business of producing or testing weapons. Period. There's a, there's a... Because it conflicts and infects essential missions of the university. One is the free exchange. But there are a lot of others that you know better than I that are affected. There's a division of labor here that should be. Now, once I asked the, the head of the University of California that question, huge, you know, 400,000 students or whatever. I mean, it's a huge, you know, University of California, Berkeley, and all the other parts of the university. I said to him in his office, I said, you think that Livermore and Lawrence Radiation Lab and have all these defense contracts, you think that's a proper mission for university. He said, well, I've thought a lot about that, he said. And while I can make arguments saying no, I finally came down saying yes. And here's why. Because I think we, the University of California, can do it better and more efficiently for the taxpayer than other institutions. That's what it came down to. Uh, and it, to me, that was a sidestep as to you know, what is this, just a management issue? Uh, there's a question of conflicting uh, purposes here, conflicting restraints and freedoms that operate. And the grad students get involved in this too. After a while, you figure, what are you going to do your thesis on? Well, you look at your professor. Your professor's got a contract with a biotech company or a computer company. Well, if you do a thesis in that area of research, you know, the professor will be more receptive. Actually, you might have some more resources for it. So it begins to distort research priorities on campuses enormously, not just graduate students, but just whether a university is going to do research in biotech in this area that has a short-term commercial payoff for the company involved, or in another area, or whether it's going to do uh, building construction research in an area that the real estate industry wants, or in an area that's needed for affordable housing for low-income people. There's something to think about. The first step is get those contracts on the website. Get those contracts on the website. Tell them you want to do term papers on these contracts. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are two things that I'm going to take from what you said uh, with me. And one of them is raising my expectations, and the other one is the citizens can't demand anything different because they couldn't see what the differences could be. And that comment in particular struck me because I started thinking about uh, the prohibitionist policies of the drug war in America and how it disproportionately affects African Americans and how people in this room are affected right now by the Higher Education Act, taking money away from the education, no resources that go towards people who have chemical dependencies when education is a proven solution to drug problems rather than imprisonment and incarceration. And uh, I'd like your intellectual input on how we could raise our expectations for the current drug war 
Well, I'm glad you asked that question. By the way, that's a very good thing to take away. I just add one other thing for you to take away, and a higher estimate of your own significance as students now to have an effect on your society and to, to hark back to maybe your parents who grew up as students in the 60s and led the way in environmental policy and civil rights struggles and fight against the war in Vietnam and uh, so on. There's uh, a lot of activity there. Uh, it was once said that without the student leadership on the war of Vietnam, we were heading for a land war with China, something Eisenhower warned us uh, about avoiding at all costs. And the students put themselves on the line. So. What is the estimate of your own significance? And to what extent do you want to be leaders in the advancement of justice as you see it over the next 15,000 days or so? Maybe 20,000, uh, 30,000, but whatever. Just have a higher estimate uh, of being leaders and, and defining leadership as producing more leaders, not more followers, which is what we try to do in the Green Party. The, the definition of leadership is to produce more leaders not more followers. The definition of leadership is to have movements of thought, not movements of knee-jerk belief. So that's, that's the approach you want to take. What is your occupational dream? And what is your civic dream? You have two dreams. Your dream to advance your, your sense of gratification from work and your standard of living for your family, and your civic dream to advance the betterment of society. The two are connected, by the way as history teaches us. Now, a failed war on drugs, you take the objectives of the failed war on drugs, and they're producing just the opposite. Communities remain endangered. Police remain endangered. Um, the prisons are filling up with drug addicts uh, who should be rehabilitated. Every study shows that it's more efficient and humane to spend money on rehabilitation instead of on prisons, instead of on militarizing the issue. And to top it off, the contrasts are quite compelling. We don't send tobacco addicts to jail, do we? We don't send alcoholics to jail, do we? Why do we send drug addicts to jail? This is medieval thinking. This is cowardly politicians who are unwilling to lead. It is so cowardly that it has even led to the prescription of the most versatile plant ever domesticated in the history of the world it has nothing to do with marijuana. It's industrial hemp. And we, we have a petition for three years now before the DEA in Washington to get industrial hemp off the prescribed list. And Clinton and General McCaffrey, his drug czar, refuse to do it. They won't even answer our petition. And there are thousands of farmers that want to grow industrial hemp. It produces clothing, fuel, food, medicines, cosmetics, lubricants, paper, and thousands of other products with minimal in a need for chemical fertilizer or pesticides, replacing the need to cut down trees, replacing some of the need to import oil. It's a spectacular plant grown by Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, the Chinese 5,000 years ago, and the medieval thinking makes it prohibited because Clinton and General McCaffrey believe that it's a stalking horse for marijuana. With one-third of 1% 1 THC, Mr. Clinton could smoke a barrel of industrial hemp <laughs> and not get high even if he inhaled. So. Three things. Rehabilitation, a priority, number one. Two, community policing. Police who work and live in the community are going to do a better job and a more humane job. While the phase out of all these drug wars, etc., is exceeded. And then the third uh, is, is to de de uh, uh, decriminalize some of these. Now, marijuana should be decriminalized. Heroin can be subjected to methadone more elaborate methadone uh, delivery systems. A harder one is cocaine and crack. You've got to find what the best ideas around the world to see what works. But you know, young people 
who are loved, who are given purpose in life, who are given useful pursuits, as the old timers say it, they're less likely to hang out on street corners, get in trouble, and become drug addicted. So it isn't just dealing with the drugs directly and rehabilitation. It's dealing with a, a culture of childhood and teenage culture that reorients these youngsters into very productive, creative, and self-affirming uh, activities in life. So there are these intangibles that lead uh, greatly. You know, there are certain people, uh, youngsters who are uh, in uh, certain religions and they have very low drug addictions, for example. Uh, for example, in tobacco smoking, you know who has the lowest rate of tobacco smoking in the entire country? Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists. So, I mean, there, there are intangibles here uh, of nurturing young people in ways where they never get close to, them, to the, those drugs. And one of them is, of course, to have a national effort to abolish poverty and abolish the brutalized situations in our inner city. <laughs> the, we have one more, please. Um, you already touched on part of this, but my question is, is, obviously you're against corporate welfare, yet you support public funding of political elections, um, which to me sounds like nothing more than welfare for politicians. Why, first of all, where in the Constitution does the federal government receive the authority to use public money towards private political campaigns? And second of all, what is the moral difference of my tax dollars being used to support a politician who I may not agree with versus my tax dollars being used to bail out a failing SNL? Well, I can avoid your question by saying that the money can be raised by a well-promoted voluntary checkoff on the tax form, the 1040 tax form, up to $250 a person. So if you don't want to give a cent, you don't have to. And you want to give up to 250 you can. It goes into a public fund. Ballot qualified candidates will have to uh, avoid taking any private money if they ta tap into the public money and they will get a certain amount of free time on television and radio. See? So that can avoid that problem. Uh, so I'm glad you raised the question. That's my preferred way of doing it. The, on the other hand, you know, you may disagree with our government's military policy, but your taxes pay for the Pentagon, right? I mean, there are a lot of things we don't have a referendum on. Uh, we can't check off our taxes saying we want this to go for education but not for uh, missile defense systems that uh, are, are uh, unworkable or whatever. Uh, so uh, that's part of living in a community. That's part of the Constitution's uh, provision on promoting the general welfare. And that's the way it's in. Well, uh, there is a little bit in all of us of not wanting to pay anything to the most detestable politician running for office. I mean, would I want my tax dollars to go to Senator McConnell from T Kentucky, you know? Uh, so one way to get around it is to have a well-promoted checkoff, not just the one dollar, you know, the, the, up to 250. And once you get free time on television, you knock out half, over half of the expenditures, half of the money raised by politicians goes to television ads. I mean, it's really interesting that the same television companies that do not cover campaigns adequately and, and keep the presidential campaign with fewer and fewer minutes on the evening news are the ones that received a billion or more dollars in television ad money, revenue. So these politicians are saying, well, what we're doing in trying to establish the leadership for this country politically, it's not newsworthy to NBC, CBS, ABC, et cetera, uh, we're not going to have to make them richer by buying the time on their airways. Messy. Yes? Um, I work for a satire publication on campus that recently had its funding pool and then reestablished after we ran issues about what the trustees were doing for the campus. And I'm wondering, just from a, a point of someone who wants to fight for certain causes, how do you balance out maintaining a level of information to the students and the student body, but also not pissing off the people that were pulled the plug and took them that You said they pulled the plug and then reestablished? We've been running for about five years, then we ran, we ran there, were, there was a lot of political things involved, but a major thing was that supposedly some trustees got angry that we mentioned that. There is a website that we mentioned uh, here. 
it talks about which trustees provide which monies to fund the school. And uh, we printed some of the things, just, just for information purposes, about what they did and where the, where the, I guess the political niche of RIT fills. Mm-hmm. And uh, they removed that funding for that. Well, they're pretty. Th- they, they must be pretty thin-skinned, since by your own admission, it's satire, right? Well, there one, one way to do it. One way. Do you have a, a student uh, fee uh, here? There is, but it doesn't cover us. Well, one way is to develop a self-governance process where the students allocate their student fees this way, that way. So it's up to the students, and that. They, you know, they are, after all, trying to turn you into mature, upstanding members of the community. Um, and the second is uh, to have an appeal process. I mean, do, is there a day when the trustees meet the students, like in an auditorium? They do. Well, you know, students generally, uh, students generally in the U.S. have far less uh, authority over their activities than in Western Europe, uh, and even Canada. Uh, Canada, since the 60s, uh, at most universities in Canada, they determine their student fees, where they want, what they want to do with it, and so forth. I mean, not for criminal, uh, it means, but I mean, it's a huge area of discretion. And uh, it's a tough subject, you know, you're trying to study and take exams and do well, and then this will drain on a lot of students' time. But it's very good to start a student faculty committee to discuss the overall issue of student authority, over what areas should students be able to decide for themselves uh, as to what act- what extracurricular activities are going to be funded and and so on. I know in Boise State back in the 70s, the students were assessed $50 each a year to pay for the stadium. Uh, a 